All right. Thank you, guys. I'll not really uh, delay that further. Yeah. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm sure that uh, you will be also feeling the same kind of uh, excitement since the kind of panelists that we have with me, my friends, they come from a very different background. Uh, we have Pankaj from PwC. We have a lot many more members from advertising background and, the brand, and of course, brands. And the kind of brand portfolio that we have here is a mixed combination of all the categories. So uh, clearly, when we talk about programmatic and why we are talking about a lot of inciting, I mean, that's the focus that we're going to have today. As we have seen that post-pandemic, uh, industry really changed for us. But it's not just us. Even consumers, their habits really changed post-pandemic. What did not change was clearly media evolution, which was happening earlier as well. But what really helped was programmatic really evolved. Only for the fact because we could see that audiences started moving towards a very evolved way of even buying and even having the consumer habits, which was kind of omni-channel. We could see a lot many uh, consumers moving completely towards an online world uh, away from retail. Many could you know, go more towards a retail environment to understand what kind of requirements do they have. And similarly, we could see our brands navigating towards it immediately. right? So a first question, and I think we should be around same that, is that while media habits of the consumers has been changing and are at a very rapid um, pace altogether, so how do you think advertising has really taken over uh, its care towards programmatic? And I really want to ask this question to Prabhakar, because Prabhakar, when it comes to his category, his brand, I think that's one of the brands where uh, for them to quickly navigate towards programmatic was a challenge and the way they see how programmatic adds value for them, especially with consumers changing the behavior. So what's your view, Prabhakar, on that? Yeah, uh, thanks, Dimpi, and uh, thank you, everyone. <coughs> yeah, I'm happy to be here today. So uh, I think uh, the world of advertising has always been full of challenges, and uh, the challenges are of multiple nature, you know, and uh, right now we are talking it in the parlance of media choices, cost, effectiveness, etc. And uh, to my mind, uh, programmatic has been a boon in a big way because uh, while uh, change is the only const constant and it looks good as a quotation, but uh, look at the customer digital behavior. Now pre-COVID, post-COVID, we are talking about two different worlds altogether, right? How do you keep track of it as a marketeer and advertiser, right? You cannot simply you know, know which publishers have worked with you in past you know, it, it cannot be about where do you scale up, you know, where do you scale down. Uh, you rather depend on uh, your uh, programmatic advertising partners and you also work on the platforms so that at all point of time, you know, you are uh, in line with the changing customer behavior. While it is easy to many times measure the impact in, program, uh, in uh, performance marketing because there you are aware of what are your cost KPIs, revenue KPIs, and other conversion KPIs, it becomes all the more difficult when it comes to brand marketing. Because, and for many brands, in fact, for a brand like ours, Angel One, as Dimpy was pointing out, that uh, this year we are saying uh, six to 10x jump in our brand marketing spend. Now, when you're doing six to 10x jump, like which media do you use more? I mean, will you go with the business news channel, which will be a good thing to go after for a fintech broker like us, or can you go for Hindi news channel, or you go for OTT, or you go for a display campaign, how do you look at the reach, how do you look at the frequency, how do you look at the campaign optimization? I think uh, programmatic is the answer. So we have been working with uh, Zaxis, you know, uh, of Group M, and we have been leveraging uh, co-pilot kind of campaign optimization tools, and we are seeing good results, and, uh, and, I, and I believe that uh, programmatic is the solution uh, for the challenges which lies ahead. We'll talk more as we progress. Thank you, Prabhakar. And uh, I can't really you know, focus more on the fact that consumer insights plays a vital role. So Mehernosh, I'd really have to ask you, because Godrej carries a huge portfolio. And I'm sure when we talk about navigating between changes, uh, especially post-pandemic, what, what do you think had been the success story for Godrej to quickly convert, and especially keeping inciting as a factor? So I'll, I'll first talk about uh, programmatic. Uh, 550 billion US dollars is the size of the programmatic market right now, if you were to look at the world over. And it is just growing. 
But at the same time, if you were to look at programmatic, there are several uh, challenges which are coming ahead as well. You know, like third-party cookies is a big thing. You know, and it is constantly evolving. So, uh, coming back to your question, consumer inciting is very, very important. Because uh, if you do not have the insights, you're not going to be giving the right kind of brief to the agency. Okay? So, we don't budget for a plan, we plan the budget. In the way that, you know, uh, we've, we've got consumer insights which are uh, bottom up, which is from the ground level itself. We identify who the TG is, and of course, that needs to be a very, very important input for the agency in order to ensure that the programmatic advertising is effective enough. Of course, there are challenges with respect to right now and programmatic with respect to what your Romi is. A lot of people say that the Romi is high. We're not sure whether we're targeting the right people. There are other challenges like, uh, uh, you know, bots and stuff like that, you know, which which are artificial and you're not reaching the right kind of audience. But we're dealing with all of that. But before that, I, th I think the first step, uh, before getting into programmatic advertising, like any marketing campaign is inciting. And that is something that we do. The challenge, of course, that you asked me is that uh, we are into four B2C categories, which are very different from each other, uh, each having different penetration levels and each having a different marketing challenge. Uh, audience is different. Uh, buying behavior is different, attitudes are different. Okay, so an appliances uh, person might not uh, behaviorally uh, be the same as a guy, you know, who's buying a security solution for that matter. And then we've got B2B businesses as well to handle. So yeah, uh, talking about all of this, uh, CRM becomes very, very important, and I'll talk about that a little later. But that is something that we are putting into place uh, as we go along. Thanks. Thanks, MP. Thank you. I think, and that makes me happy to see that I feel a lot of preparedness is uh, happening there, especially when we talk about CRM data being put in, into place. And uh, I keep hearing this question, especially being from a programmatic core background, that what is the ROI outcome that are we, you know, planning to see effectiveness of the campaign? But I feel if the way you plan your campaign, especially inciting, taking that as the core of it and bottoms up approach. I feel that's what is required because then, when you, then you know what matrix do you need to work upon. And uh, focusing on that question, Pankaj, I would really want to have your opinion on that, that uh, when we talk about insights or analytics, from an industry perspective, what kind of role do you think or do you see for it to play, especially within programmatic? Uh, thanks, Dimpi. Uh, pretty fast evolving. I mean, it's uh, for us in the consulting world, data is about everything. And, you know, the more that we are working with our clients, we see consumer behavior being minutely assessed. Uh, you know, their patterns, their thought processes, including, you know, uh, their uh, time spent online, offline, across various channels, mediums, etc., being tracked increasingly. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, going forward, brands are going to be more and more discerning about uh, whom do they wish to engage with, how much time, and, you know, uh, what form of engagement is it. So, uh, you know, individual data is going to, uh, in individual data, thought processes and patterns of, uh, you know, behavior patterns are increasingly going to get more and more uh, sort of tracked, if I may. And uh, we are going to see the, the next five, seven, ten years, consumers being sort of, uh, you know, infiltrated with a lot of personalized uh, you know, access personalized, uh, you know, choices. So, yeah, I mean, it is significantly evolving and, you know, building up at a fairly fast pace. I see considerable amount of opportunities here for a lot of new age firms and social media businesses, etc. And uh, personalization, when we talk about that, clearly it rings a lot of bells. 
and uh, Atiyana coming on to you, especially connecting back to personalization. We know that, especially for porno, you already have a lot of restrictions within advertising, right? So when it comes to personalization that directly relates to content, mm -hmm. so how do you feel programmatic plays a role in content for a category like yours, where already when you're planning a content strat, there's a lot of restrictions around it. Yeah. So how do you na navigate that? So we do have a lot of restrictions around it, uh, but we are semi-dark in the sense that Alcobef can be advertised in India if you do it through a, you know, valid extension. And we have valid extension businesses for the same. But, you know, just coming back to the point of uh, programmatic, I think it's important to differentiate the technology from the consumer habit. I think uh, pre-pandemic, we saw programmatic being really loosely used across only digital. Everything was programmatic, right? And uh, suddenly throughout the process of uh, the pandemic, you have programmatic television in the form of connected television. You have programmatic outdoor in the form of D outdoor and many more such things and even maybe programmatic radio on the verge of, you know, coming out. So the whole thing was following the consumer and then figuring out what customization it needs. For example, if I have a brand called Absolute, and the extension is absolute glassware. I know that that brand stands for inclusivity. It stands for the fact that it's born colorless, it's born to mix. We did a series of content videos about, you know, different kinds of challenges that the youth faces today. Did plan for the kind of cohorts we would like to target them on and then use them on different platforms. Plan for the data that we expected on those different platforms. So we delivered it through digital, through connected TV, uh, through, you know, social media. And it's very interesting to see how some of those content pieces would differ and the reaction by consumers are so different. For example, on CTV, we did see a lot of people just running through completing the ad and spending a lot of time despite it being skippable. But on social media, we found people sharing, commenting, writing DMs to us saying, oh my God, I have another story that I can do. So it's not just about, you know, uh, programmatic. I think to just look upon it as just a technology that helps you customize. It's also to understand that technology into your creative, into the medium, and what's the reaction you're getting out of that medium. Preparing for that entire plan, knowing what are the kind of metrics you're going to track across each of them, and then comparing them and using them for your next campaign, saying, okay, again, if I have to create a similar campaign, these would be the content pieces, these would be the mix that I would use programmatically or non-programmatically, and this is the outcome I expect. So I think it helps you plan in a certain way, get your outcomes to a certain place. So I, I would actually think programmatic is a larger tech, and ultimately, all consumer consuming mediums sort of will come under it. Thank you, Atika. That really covers a lot of wide perspective. But I really want to hear Deepa, your views as well, because we know Starbucks, the way it entered our market, it had just raised entire uh, web section, especially into coffees, right? And it has lived up to it even till date. And so I, and I've seen a lot of uh, awareness campaigns being done for Starbucks. How do you see programmatic fitting into the scheme of Starbucks for a brand which is already doing so well? Within, I mean, for awareness within the respective category. So since you mentioned coffee, I'll just start on a lighter note by saying the previous uh, speaker offered you free coffee. I'll offer you the best, which is, of course, Starbucks, <laughs> but it's not going to be free. Um, you know, I mean, the, let's look at some of the statistics. Uh, Mehrnoj talked about $550 billion globally. In India, the programmatic advertising market is slated to be around 18 to 20, give or take, this year, right? So that's a huge size. Second statistic, out of the 1.4 billion population that we have, I don't know whether I'm supposed to be proud of that number or not, but here we are, almost 57% is Gen Z and millennials. So you're talking about 800 million, give or take, is Gen Z or millennial. That's our core TG. We have to be where they are supposed to be. I think before I even talk about programmatic advertising, I want to start by saying, First of all, really know your consumer well and what you're expecting from each campaign. There might be a campaign where you want to do awareness, but for, you know the business objective is awareness from the point of view of getting, let's say today, a non-Starbucks consumer coming to Starbucks. So then I identify that consumer 
And then, of course, programmatic is a way to get to the consumer. I'm of the firm belief that garbage in, garbage out. Uh, it's almost like saying if I had a driverless car, but I don't know where to go, I might be sitting in this really fancy vehicle, but I might land up going to you know, Las Vegas, which is a great destination, but I actually wanted to go to Japan, right? So it all starts with, I think, first knowing your consumer. Uh, then programmatic to me is a very sharp layer, which helps you identify with precision and gives a personalized message to where the audience is. Because the biggest problem of this generation is an eight second or lower attention span, right? So how do you catch on to this audience? How do you stay relevant to this audience? I unfortunately feel that today with programmatic, we are again becoming a push economy with advertising. You know, advertising was always supposed to be a pull economy where you're creating pull amongst your consumers with fantastic insights, with fantastic creative. So let programmatic not be the easy way out for you to forget, I think, some of the basics and fundamentals of advertising. So really to sum it up, when we look at advertising or programmatic, we start by looking at who's the consumer we want to target, why do we want to target that consumer, what's the business problem, very sharply defining who that consumer is, and then, of course, this becomes a very powerful tool, I think, to get to him or her or them. Yeah, thank you, Deepa. And I would uh, really say that this one uh, point that you focused on, which was eight seconds attention span, which is true. But at the same time, we all are always on phone, and especially Gen Z, right? And we can see consumption happening on phone numbers. Stats talk about that. That also brings us to the point that the uh, world is getting fragmented. And if you're only eight seconds, attention span is happening. We're always on one screen, switching to another, then the third one. So, Mehendush, I'm going to ask you that in such a fragmented ecosystem, even for an advertiser, when you're knowing a consumers, and data talks about that, insights tell us that uh, cohorts are increasing, audiences are everywhere, platforms are increasing, and even for us, for advertising, channels are increasing. So, that also brings, po brings a point of duplication for advertisers, and then uh, we are seeking at programmatic. But for you, having such a large portfolio, different kind of audience sets, and of course, categories such complex in terms of you know, having, covering all these uh, segments together, how do you really fit that so well in your scheme of you know, strategy? Yeah, so uh, it is definitely a challenge. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, you know, uh, the kind of duplication could be tremendous. And uh, I like what Deepa said you know, with respect to the way in which you, you need to plan. So it is like any advertising campaign that you do before programmatic, you need to define your audience, et cetera, very well. So there are several AI tools and uh, a lot of uh, tools which are available right now, softwares which are available right now, which will, be, which will ensure that you're not uh, duplicating it. Okay, so uh, that becomes very important. I think uh, one of the big challenges, and I don't know if that question is coming data, but I just wanted to answer that right now is uh, third party data and, and cookies, you know, if, if those go away, programmatic is going to become a real problem. You know, and, and that's what a lot of people are wondering. So there are, uh, there are solutions right now which are coming where people are now depending upon telcos. You know, because telcos can give you data which is unduplicated, you know, which, which is phone number based. And at the same time, you can uh, do browsing patterns across apps and stuff like that, and you can target them depending upon what your cohort is. So sharply defining what your cohort is and constantly monitoring your uh, programmatic advertising and uh, the uh, telco software that I'm talking about, we just had a conversation with one such uh, person. He's a startup. Uh, he's done a lot of work in Indonesia. He's not done a lot of work in India as yet. But he's tied up with Vodafone, and very soon he's going to be tying up with the second largest uh, or the largest uh, telecom company. And uh, that software is going to be complementing the existing CRM that you already have and the existing media buying agency with who you're working with. So, for instance, if it is Madison, which is in our case, uh, it would rest there, okay, and it would work with a CRM in order to ensure that we use uh, telco data, which is different from uh, the normal programmatic data, in order to target. Yeah, so those are some of the things that uh, we are working towards. Fair enough, and absolutely, and I think that remains a key question also for the industry. 
uh, as every marketer has their different opinion when it comes to post cookie world because uh, we don't have a concrete answer yet and a lot of beta campaigns are being done and Prabhakar I think you have great insights with you on that already because we we're just talking about it backstage when I overheard him talking about CRM data so would you really want to share those insights with the wide forum here see we heard two statistics you know one for the world wide market for you know uh, programmatic advertising and we heard about the Indian market and whenever there is a market there is a solution so I'm not much bothered about you know what will happen there eventually like some solution will emerge right like for example Mernos was talking about like you know what's happening in the telecom sector see fundamentally we have to look at programmatic you know uh, in its true essence and there I would like to look at programmatic separately between performance marketing and brand marketing when it comes to performance marketing you know mostly at least for a category which is a 3-4 percent penetration like ours you understand which publishers are working well for you right you have an idea you know how to scale it you know to what extent they can be scaled and you know after what point you know the revenue it will drop right but you still use programmatic advertising in such places also because there are other advantages you know there are other advantages regarding you know dynamic creative optimization and, and multiple other you know uh, parameters on reach frequency dynamic customer journeys omni channel and whatnot but when it comes to brand marketing you know programmatic advertising will still re remain relevant because in programmatic advertising you're you know solving for reach you're solving for you know going to large uh, publishers you know who have audience similar to what you want to accomplish so that way that will work very very beautifully uh, in my mind also the reach and frequency unduplicated reach uh, using first party data like for example in the recent campaign which we are doing with Zaxis uh, we have our own first party data to exclude uh, you know our own uh, current clients we have also put first party data of phone pay to go after you know certain set of uh, potential customers all of that is not possible if we do not you know leverage uh, programmatic advertising to that degree also let's understand you know beyond a point cookie cookie uh, cookie world is about behavioral targeting contextual targeting will never go out of you know kind of uh, fashion and uh, you know so there also programmatic advertising can help so I mean uh, we can debate and I mean this is a much much larger topic but I believe there is a market there are solution and there will be more solutions in future having such a mix of panelists I mean that's what we get on the table because different insight comes from a different category and uh, now Deepa I would want to ask, ask you same question because again that's a different category so what what kind of target I mean does it also bother you because of course for Meher Nosh the kind of advertising brands they have similarly for Prabhakar the kind of category they have it's of high importance but do you feel even for you is it just region frequency that takes over the primary matrix for you or do you feel that even data for that matter post cookie world does that really bother or that's a priority for you right now to plan your campaigns I think right now we're kind of living in the year and now but um, I having said that we have access to a huge amount of first party data right so we could you know in effect collect which we don't necessarily do but we could collect data from customers at the point of sale whenever you come into a store and you know ask for a Starbucks what we do have is a very very large loyalty member base of more than 2.6 million in India whose data we have having said that I think one is we are quite sensitive of how we use that first party data because we want to be very clear about consent uh, terms and you know not invading a customers privacy because my view is that if you don't take that into account your advertising will be a blind spot right so that's that's one thing which you're looking at so uh, I think we are better placed than people who may not have access to first party data because we do uh, we serve more than four lakh customers every week in our stores so we do have access to a lot of first party data and then I think the bridge that we're going to have to cross is how do we ensure proper consent and then make it relevant to them your other question on reach and frequency I don't think it's as simple in that and you know various campaigns would have as you would you know imagine different objectives 
Yes, we're growing at a very, very rapid uh, rate in India. We have a presence in almost 50 cities today. We have close to 350 outlets, and you know we've gone on record to say that we will be much, much more. So obviously, reach is going to be important, but it's going to be about reaching the audience today who is either sitting on the fence or not really, you know, already frequenting, uh, f uh, frequenting uh, Starbucks. So it's going to be about, I think, again, laser-guided reach. Um, and I also believe that this whole game of programmatic or this buying CPMs in that sense will have to be balanced by brand engagement. There will have to be activities that you do. We're not really bothered about, uh, you know, just the CPM, but you're actually looking at how engaged is my audience and I'm, am I able to create content which is going to further brand love. And that becomes extremely important for an iconic brand like ours because many times we don't even have to create content. Our consumers create content and celebrities create content. I have sometimes a reverse problem where, you know, I might see a Kareena Kapoor walking out with a Starbucks cup, but I will never post it because it's kind of invading, you know, I mean, it's a gray area, right? So I won't even go there. So that's the way I would look at it. Yeah, fair enough, absolutely. Pankaj, what's your view on this, uh, especially from PwC? You have a lot of insights in terms of how industry looks at the fact that first party data and privacy, the way the even laws are being formed in India. What's your view on that? How is industry taking that? And are we prepared for it? Sure, no. Uh, I think a very relevant point you brought up, a fortnight back we had the uh, Data Privacy Act come out and this is again posed a whole host of uh, challenges around first party data, business data, you know, consent terms, the, uh, the way we could possibly interpret some of these uh, consent terms, be it banking, you know, industries like fintech, information providers, etc. And uh, my take is a lot of interpretation is still due. It's taking place. And uh, yeah, we are in for times where even emojis on WhatsApp, you know, we've had some cases in Australia and England where, you know, a, a simple thumbs up on WhatsApp was considered an acceptance and which led to a litigation suit being filed by the other party, you know. So, I mean, we will have some of this evolving and more so in the advertising world where, you know, if, if there's data from social media which is taken without permission, how much of it could be used if it's posted by friends, third party, can that be used? Or if it's posted by the individual, individuals themselves, is that valid to be used? So I think it's evolving. I mean, interesting next uh, a few quarters on, on how the jurisprudence plays out on this. So, yeah. yeah right. Um, this, this is the point that we, I think when we talk about programmatic, we in a way of overlook, which is social media. We take this still as a separate budget, but I feel in coming days and times, the way the world is evolving, the way media is evolving, especially when I heard Pankaj talking about data and consent and social media coming in together. And even Atika, when she talked about Perno, where heavy, of, uh, I mean, heavy thoughts are on content generation and social media, I feel that even social media and data privacy clauses are definitely going to be a subset of it, if not completely, in times. So, I think what's your view on it when you talk about content generation or social media, and of course, then data privacy laws coming into picture, and then on top you have your programmatic strat that plays a role. So, how do you look at all of this getting combined together? See, honestly, uh, we are operating in a world, uh, especially I think for all the MNCs, where despite not having GDPR in India, we followed, uh, we are almost GDPR compliant because most of our parent offices are in Europe where it's mandatory. So even now, I mean, the data collection is done with consent, like, uh, you know, Deepa mentioned previously, where you don't put up celebrity pictures. We have so many people just tagging us for a lot of our fancy brands, and we as a company have taken a policy 
that despite being allowed to advertise on social media for alcohol, we really don't. We've put back our pages up. So I think a couple of things that will be very important is uh, to gain consumers, you have to gain their trust. You have to serve them as in the environment that they are in and to talk to them in a language that they understand the best. And to do that, you need to ensure that one, their consent is taken. You reach them on the platforms that you know they are available at. Uh, the second thing is uh, the kind of content uh, contextualization that we do. I think sometimes it's very scary when you just scroll Facebook and or any other social media and you just talk, oh my god, I need to buy something from XXS brand and in the next 15 minutes, you get a pop-up and say, oh my god, there's, there's an ad. I think those kind of things is something that we as a category stay away from because we are anyways dark in India and we do not, you know, sort of resort to that. So there are a couple of things. One is consent is very important. Even when we target, we look at people who have interacted with brands that are similar to ours and categories that are similar to ours. Second is, uh, what is the contextualization you're doing in the local environment? For example, a lot of people in India may be offended if even an alcohol extension product reaches out to them. So across our creatives, you have the option of saying, this ad is inappropriate, please do not reach out to me again. So I think with programmatic at the base of it, like you're saying, consent and being conscious of the consumer because I don't know if he or she really buys my product. I assume that they do at some point because my category has a penetration of about 10. But to make sure that for them it is not embarrassing, we keep these things in place and these are the levers we need to keep in place as an industry in general across the various uh, mediums, whether programmatic or not and specifically on social media. I think it can become too intrusive or uh, it can just look like something that they don't want to be a part of. I hope right. I've answered your question. No, no, of course. <laughs> and it's, it's so intriguing. I really want to ask more, but in the rest of time, I want to also touch base on hot topic, which is, of course, beyond the buzzword artificial intelligence, which has now spanned way too much. It's not just about optimizing campaigns, but uh, artificial intelligence has legs and hands around, which is in form of augmented reality, generative AI, and whatnot, right? And as I am so blessed to have a panelist which comes from different background, so I'm sure AI plays a different role for each one of you. And I really want to hear all of you when it comes to AI. So I'll start from Meher Nosh with you that when it comes to artificial intelligence, I hear, especially in your category, that it's not AI for us, but amplified intelligence. That is a lot, a lot of human intelligence with our own personal insight and then AI which plays a role for us. So how do you see this fit for you? I'll definitely answer that question, but Atika mentioned that you know she was she was thinking about something. I was talking to a friend, and suddenly in 15 minutes that popped up. So <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was shocked. As in, where did the data come from? So it is it is really very creepy. It, it certainly is. So programmatic sometimes can get extremely creepy if consent is not taken. But answering to your question, uh, we are into diverse industries, and uh, for furniture, for that matter, AR and AI makes a very important, uh, plays a very important role. So ensuring that when the consumer comes onto the website, giving the consumer an experience of how the furniture looks like at his house, how does it feel when you're moving a sofa, you know, how does it mean when, you're, when you are uh, erecting something on your own. So these things become very important, a security product for the appliances. So all of that, giving that consumer that immersive experience, you know, with respect to AI is, is very important as well. So. Those are things that we have been doing, and even for our B2B businesses, uh, we have been doing a lot of these things. So uh, some of our shop floors are not accessible for uh, some of our consumers, and uh, for security reasons. So we've we've done a complete animation of that, and we've ensured that you know we we do that, and we use uh, AI significantly there as well. Yeah, thank you. Right, right. So that's an interesting use case where we see a brand. Godrej using AI for immersive experience, but I feel maybe that's different for Angel One because the category is too, too opposite. So Prabhakar, how do you see AI playing a role for Angel One? Actually, uh, you're absolutely right. It's very different from Godrej because if you look at it, I mean, we don't sell anything actually. So we're just a transaction platform. You know, there are exchanges, there are shares. People come, uh, buy, sell, hold, take margin funding, whatnot. 
see to fundamentally we deal with data you know and data is the lifeblood of ai right so and also so of course it has multiple use cases in our business but just to give a framework uh, for this discussion i think the first point uh, as a marketer is uh, in terms of content i think uh, content uh, thanks to generative ai and uh, multiple mid journey you know adobe has come out with uh, you know some new tools on that uh, content making has become uh, amazingly fast amazingly accurate and amazingly spectacular you know so this is something uh, that is amazing you know it cuts down on a lot of time media fragmentation means content fragmentation multiple cohort means multiple content so that's where ai helps a lot the second part comes in is where you need to make uh, optimization and when i say optimization it could be any funnel optimization media optimization looking at data patterns which are not available to naked eyes uh, you know comparing lot many things you know where ai ml can do wonders uh, and the functional area could be marketing functional area could be sales so that's where you know it is helping us like take for example we do one program which we have really mastered in last three and half years we call alcp accelerated lead conversion program and this uh, program really helps us uh, you know kind of uh, accelerate uh, customer journey through our funnel and gives us added conversion uh, advantage in our business right and not just that you know i mean uh, when it comes to advisory when it comes to learning platform lot more uh, personalization can be done using ai so uh, for a business like us you know which deals in data generates data uh, ai is like a steam engine 200 years back you know i mean we really believe that this will take us to places where no one has gone before thank you prabhaka that really has a lot of value to it and just to add to prabhaka's point even i have witnessed that uh, campaign optimizations like mehnoosh had been clearly pointing out and very correctly that this world still has a lot of bot this world still has a lot of uh, black box which needs to be addressed where then ai plays a very vital role because data reading with when it comes to billions of trails of data it's not really possible for a human eye to even read that kind of data set and identify but yeah clearly ai is bringing us algorithms and models which can help in work on dual goals three goals together and help us reach you know uh, media outcomes in a very effective manner but at the same time it could be different for pankaj because pankaj comes from a very inciting background pwc definitely not uh, sharing only one particular view but having a clearly 360 holistic uh, 360 degree holistic view on that so how do you see ai because when we look at it we look at it at maybe immersive experiences or just activation but do we have more to it dimpy pwc works with clients i mean we are a consulting firm so for us you know it's uh, ai various tools of ai and you know how do they make a difference in to our clients their ways of operating their businesses you know how do they predict customer behavior how do they predict trends in the industry how do they come up with newer models of disruption you know how are they seeing uh, changes being very rampant you know at a very very fast pace so you know just the other day we had uh you know within the firm a group of people were asked to role play and moderate on something it this was more like an internal session and we we actually had someone use a tool and this was a uh, you know a a clone i would say a better you, you know delivered a message much more better articulated much more better sort of richer content and with messages that that probably had two or three different dimensions to what the creators of the sort of panel had thought about so i think you know if, if i look at industries this is going to be very disruptive you know you had you have today a well known influencer a celebrity coming to indoors a product tomorrow you may have a you know much better a much better persona 
you know, a, a clone coming and, you know, endorsing something and, uh, you know, that could be much more impactful, much more better received. So, uh, uh, you know, data in the way it is going to be used and increasingly so, you know, various tools that are going to bring about this disruption in ease, convenience, probably the costs of campaigns could drastically come down to, you know, one-tenth of what they are now. And, you know, we could see a whole host of these changes coming through. So, you know, interesting times ahead. Maybe people like us could be redundant. Yeah, jobs could be very menial three years down the line. So, yeah. <laughs> You're a brave man if you see that. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean. You prepare for the next best thing. Yeah. You don't stay quiet now. I feel Pankaj, so I mean when digital started, we all heard that because tradition was all about, you know, uh, manas, a lot of manas. But we could still see everybody working, everybody employed, of course now on AI. So I'm sure as we say that it's amplified intelligence, which is human working together with AI, bringing to that. But very interestingly, two points you, you know, kind of pointed out, which is efficiency, cost drastically coming out. And we could see that especially in the form of automation, where AI not just for experiences or activation of campaign, but reporting, which remains the biggest problem area for everybody because it's a lot of uh, data crunching that's required. And for any advertiser to kind of put a lot of weeks and months on that data, then it's of no use because you're not planning your next campaign. So AI has really helped that because you can overnight now, you know, put your uh, algos in place and you can see what data insights do you want to see for. But second interesting point where you say that content generation can happen very quickly with AI. So I was going through uh, this article which was talking about generative AI and as we all know that generative AI goes into two forms. Uh, we have, I'll not name the brands, but a lot of new uh, brands are coming in where you just type keywords and they give you entire content, even write emails on your behalf, which even I use for that matter. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I was also seeing on Instagram that a lot of, uh, when MI3 movie got launched, a lot of content was being generated around actors, their faces, though they had not shot it, which was generative AI, right? And when we, Atika, talk about content and AI, I think there's nobody better than you to represent that because Perno does a lot of content variation yeah. and AI is the new buzzword, which is beyond buzzword in fact. So yeah. how does that play a role for you? So Dimpi, actually I uh, have the benefit uh, from my fellow panelists to not operate on really any performance driving campaigns and I look at all mediums equally to drive awareness for my brands and based on that I can tell you like you know uh, we spoke about earlier that AI of course makes you create the most immersive experiences, Alcobef parties and you know experiences are all about that we've done that coming to content generation yes like you said for the mi3 movie even for barbie i think and Oppenheimer to a large extent a lot of content was generated via ai automated and your entire social feeds were full of them i think the cost of content generation may reduce and the effort to do it because right now you know the cost of creating a tvc and going through the whole thing so that'll crunch the time uh, of creating it, creating multiple versions, and but I still do think you will need human intervention, specifically for categories like ours, which are based on lifestyle, which are very nuanced in how they communicate. So I think it's going to use like amplified intelligence where a human controls the AI. Uh, but what I'd really like to see with AI and uh, you know programmatic is because we don't ultimately sell. Uh, I, I would really be interested in seeing uh, a predictive analysis of which is pre the campaign that I've run, what is it going to give me and not in terms of reach and frequency, in terms of my brand KPIs. How do they move, where do they move, what are the gaps and if that, because we do have that but it's not automated and a robust machine learning to be further you know, encapsulated and I'm sure everybody here does have that and we don't as a category considering our constraints. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing that I would really want uh, AI to specifically do for the programmatic industry, which will benefit categories like ours, is to create a safe environment for our brands. Because it's, uh, you know, programmatic, while it's an exceptional tool, it has the scale 
and it'll you know put you right where the consumer is i don't know if as a brand i want to be seen there and the consumer to remember me saying oh my god i saw that ad on that particular content i don't think i'm buying it so from our perspective i think ai if you know it helps us in two ways which is predictions of what my campaigns would do to a certain brand and if there are gaps which i can meet and that's a continuous cyclical learning uh, and which is across platforms do not give me like okay this platform has this bls and that one has that not that and the last portion would definitely be providing a very very safe environment for my brands to play in very fair enough and i feel atika i mean the days are not really far ahead though we uh, had certain partners who used to provide such solution like uh, you know grape shot long ago yes, Con yes. yeah but i feel especially with a uh, entire pandora of first party data coming into picture and post cookie world where contextual uh, targeting would really take that role up and contextual targeting will not just be around, around keywords that's going to be beyond yeah more to do with context right yeah so i feel that yes those days are ahead for us and yeah. we will definitely have the yeah. solutions yeah sure. moving to deepa again so yes ai we want that to happen we want uh, personalization but i would never want to go away with my name on the coffee cup right <laughs> that has still want very much manual but uh, just kidding how do you see ai playing a role for starbucks so you've hit the nail on the head you know i mean uh, i think what you for example for brands like us it is all about the experience i mean why has starbucks become an iconic brand it's of course the coffee is there but i always say people come to starbucks for the coffee but they stay back for the warmth and the connection that moment when you walk into a store when the barista asks you your name writes it on the cup and then calls it out loud a lot of consumers tell us they really feel seen and heard they feel like heroes and sheroes and that's what's forming the connection so you know my strategy as far as ai is very simple it's an acronym called cope we are all coping with ai and you know everybody on the panel has touched on aspects of it the c really stands for very agile creativity customization right i think that's where ai is going to be absolutely on top of its game the o stands for optimization we spoke about it in some way you're kind of getting rid of things or tasks which a computer can do better than you and you're optimizing on that the p really is on prediction and prediction you know atika spoke about prediction on uh, social but i think there's also for example for brands like ours if i can do predictive work with ai on how my consumer and especially my loyalty consumers likely to behave what consumers likely to churn out which consumers most amenable to increasing frequency and so on and so forth so the p is really for prediction across various formats and e is the one which i love the most is about experience which you talked about how can you make ai generated content ai generated predictions ai generated optimization full of experiences is the future going to be like you know all brands are going to be looking like the same or doing much the same stuff how can i make sure that the experience that you get inside my store is what i you know carry to you when i come to you on any medium so for me it's really about humanizing the digital and you know in an increasingly digital world we are also the most lonely generation 46% of consumers across the world and in india have said they going through some form of mental illness or other or feeling a sense of loneliness so you know it's the experience which matters and i'll give you a very quick example of what starbucks is doing in the us it's called starbucks odyssey which is really a program where you can experience you know starbucks you can mine nfts and use it to buy a beverage in india if you visit our fort store you'll actually have we have an ai wall which literally comes alive with the story of coffee and the wall so it is about experiences because otherwise what differentiates your brand from the next that really touches a lot of chords there just to add there deepa we've got this cafe in bangalore i mean they have a face recognition system so as you walk in and get towards the attendant he asks you so your hazelnut mocha or the hot chocolate with irish topping that you had a couple of months back so yeah yeah right thank you pankaj for that uh so while we have heard a lot of difference in sides and opinions coming from our panelists but i feel and to conclude this session that 
One voice that I could clearly see was that programmatic stands for experiences, stands for efficiency, it stands for targeting uh, audiences for the different matrix in a very efficient environment. But I feel what we are also in a way coping ahead in these times is bigger issue which is fragmentation, a lot of channels coming into picture. So I definitely see programmatic becoming more integrated day by day. And I really hope that day comes when we only see that one line item in a campaign, which is just the budget, and we know that there's an inventory at the back, but everything else becomes important key pillars and matrix, which is a must have where we need to have AI to optimize a campaign. We need to have AI to generate the content, and where we are focusing only on great insights and analytics. And then I really hope that that, that day really comes. But I'm hoping that comes very soon, because the VR advertiser are moving towards this, and the kind of experiences they're bringing on the table, I'm sure. I mean, there are good times ahead. Thank you.